Let's talk about some of the ways, some of the mistakes, I suppose I should say, that people employ to set their anti-skating force. Perhaps the most egregious of these is the use of a test record. The idea behind these anti-skating test tracks is that there are a number of uh, grooves that are modulated at higher and higher amplitudes, uh, and you are to use them starting at the lower amplitude going up to the higher amplitude grooves and you're supposed to adjust your anti-skating force so that you can rid yourself of um, any distortion you hear in the channels balance them at some point when the amplitude gets high enough of course you'll just hear distortion in both channels and you can't do anything about that well here's the real big problem with this type of approach remember skating force is a function of two things effective moment arm and friction and the higher the groove velocity, the amplitude of the, of the undulations in the groove, the higher the frictional force. Again, the louder the music, the more friction, the more skating force. Same thing with the test track. But these test tracks are cut at amplitudes no responsible recording engineer would ever record at. Yet we are asked to use them as a reference for what skating force is like. This is the problem. It will you use this approach and you will certainly overdo your anti-skating force by anywhere from 50 to 90 percent. Please do not use these test tracks for the application of your anti-skating force. Almost for sure it will cause that damper in the cartridge to be squealing for mercy and you'll never know it. You'll never get to hear how good that cartridge really is. Well, using your ear to dial in your anti-skating force might get you a little bit closer, but we are dealing with a multivariate system here. This is mechanical transcription after all. You can't change one variable without changing other variables. This is exactly why WAM engineering uses a parametric approach where we identify all of the variables that there are to optimize and we hit each one individually so we don't have to worry about the influential factor that each of them have with each other. So in the case of using your ear is also quite possible that if you've got, let's say, high static friction, you'll never be able to hear or know that you have this high static friction. For this, you need something like a Wally skater to measure it. So while using your ear may or may not get you in the ballpark, it certainly won't reveal some of the many problems that could exist in your arm. How about the more recently popular using a blank record to have the arm just slowly drift in inwards um, and sometimes using the area in the uh, the, the dead wax well okay <laughs> first of all what do you mean by slowly what's the velocity secondly the frictional force that is occurring between the very tip of that stylus that you've got and the record will vary based on many different things one the profile of the very tip of that stylus, which by the way is not the part of the stylus that contacts the groove walls. And of course the amount of plasticizers in your record. You could take potentially two different records, one's a little harder than the other, and get two very different results in terms of that velocity of that arm going inward. Further, if your arm has high static friction, you wouldn't know it. In fact, you could have a scenario where you applied zero anti-skating force, but your arm, unbeknownst to you, has high static friction and when you lower it onto a moving record, it could just stay right there. Or, as you believe you're chasing, it will move slowly inward. This effort is still fraught with a lot of variability, and you won't be able to see into the behavior of your arm. It won't tell you that your, whether your arm has a problem with high static friction or not. There's even one solution out there in the market that uses intermodulation distortion measurements to measure for optimal uh, anti-skating force. Well, <laughs> this is order. This this effort is measuring third-order phenomena. It's like if I wanted to know something genetically about you, I study your first cousin. That doesn't work. I could might maybe know a little bit of something about you, but I won't know any much 
worthwhile about you. I'm measuring something that is second, third, fourth order removed. So this idea is a really bad idea and will not, well, it's certainly going to cause a lot of confusion is what it would do. And like the other tests, will not let you know if you have high static friction. By the way, this question about whether the arm has high static friction or not, I have actually seen a few different tone arm models where tone arm behaved beautifully with anti-skating turn off. In other words, no static friction and no internal horizontal torque force. But as soon as you turned on the anti-skating mechanism, the arm locked up and the static friction went through the roof. This is not something that you can measure that I know of without a Wally skater. Well, I suppose the other approach that really doesn't work to optimize your anti-skating is the approach that simply throw your hands in the air and say, well, it doesn't matter because skating force varies across the surface of the record. And this is true. Skating force, as I talked about in an earlier video in this series, does vary depending on the playing radius and the friction coefficient of the groove stylus interface. But this is not a reason to throw our hands up in the air. Like any distribution of, of variability, there is a mean, and we're aiming for it. 10% of your VTF. Use that Wally skater wisely. I hope this soundbite video series on skating force was useful for you. Until next week, on the next soundbite, see ya.